as you probably guessed, we're still in the book of Colossians. No matter what I do, just can't seem to get out of it. And uh, I had planned tonight to do, try and get to the end of chapter one, but I got stuck in one verse, so sorry. Um, and tonight I'm entitled this, Suffering in Service of Saviour and Saint. Say that with me. Suffering in Service of Saviour and Saint. Lots of s tonight, lots of S's. So hopefully you'll remember that. In part nine, a few weeks ago, um, in our study of Paul's epistle to the Colossians, we focused our attention on chapter one, verses 21 to 23. Kind of the start of verse 23, and we're going to pick it up there tonight. In part nine, I entitled From Foe to Friend. And in that short study, I hope you remember, we learned the wonderful truth that we, as believers, like the Colossians, who were once enemies of God, alienated, estranged, shut out from Almighty God, have now been reconciled. And we know that's good news, isn't it? We have been reconciled. The relationship with God has been restored and repaired through and by Jesus Christ in the body of his flesh through death. That's what Paul wrote to the Colossian believers. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary enabled this reconciliation and this beautiful restoration. Church, let's never take for granted concerning what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Let's never take that for granted. Let's never forget the price that he paid to bring us back to the Father, back to God, after repairing that broken relationship that man had with God ever since the fall way back there in Genesis. And why did he do it? Why do it at all? Would verse 22 give us these wonderful words? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Church, this is truly incredible. By the sacrifice and by the substitutionary atonement of the Son of God, we now stand alongside those Colossian believers. We stand before the Lord of all creation, the one true God who was and is and is soon to come. We stand holy before him. Isn't that amazing? We stand clothed in his righteousness. And Jesus is, pre is presenting us to the Father, blameless and above reproach. Church, that's good news. That's very good news. And it's good news for every single one of us who have confessed Jesus as Lord and trust in him as Savior. And last week I finished, sorry, two weeks ago I finished by saying, we are now friends of God. Do you remember I sang at the start of that? I am a friend of God. Well, it's truth. That is truth. We are holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. What did it mean to be morally pure in the sight of God, sacred, set apart, consecrated, a most holy thing, faultless, unblemished, without blame, unreprovable, without accusation, and irreproachable? Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. All those things, that is what we are. Look, church, do you see what he has done for us? Do you see it? And do you see where we now stand? That was good news for all of those believers in Colossa, and it's brilliant news for all of us tonight. But remember, there was an if. There was an if. There was a condition. You see, God had done his part, but now he asked us, he asked the Colossians, and I do believe he's asking us to do our part too. You see, we don't get to live how we want and trample the sacrifice of Jesus underfoot. We don't. We have our side of the deal to uphold. You see, God has standards. We talk about them all the time. God has standards. He has commandments that we must obey if we are to stay in that close, intimate, restored relationship that he has provided. He, he did it. He made a way. But it's up to us to stay in there, to stay committed, and to stay in that intimate relationship with him. Listen to what Paul and Timothy wrote. They said, if indeed you continue in the faith, that was the condition, continue in the faith. Jude wrote in his short letter these words that we all know so well. We all know this. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary <clears throat> to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Words of instruction and wisdom from Jude to the believers there in the churches of Asia Minor. What did he say? Contend earnestly for the faith. Paul and Timothy then went on to urge the brothers and sisters in Colossae to be grounded and steadfast. 
grounded was to stay in a firm foundation, to be rooted, to be planted, to be established. Steadfast was to be settled, to be in a place where you are literally immovable. You see, Paul encouraged and he was exhorting the believers to stay in the faith, to stay grounded, to stay rooted, to stay stabilized, to stay settled and to stay steadfast. And thirdly, then he exhorted the Colossians to be moved away, not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Paul was saying, my Colossian friends, your friends of God, that this gospel is good news. It's a message of hope for all who hear it. And now that you've heard it, now that you've received it, I don't want you to be removed from it in any way because there's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like the good news that you've heard. There's nothing like the good news that leads to salvation and the life eternal in Jesus Christ. Paul was saying this is the true hope. It's not a false hope. It's not a fake hope. It's not a hope that's going to lead you astray. It's not going to lead you down somewhere where you don't want to go to a, to a destructive end or, or to, 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 to no hope. This is hope with substance and foundation. It is the truth of God given unto you. And Paul wanted to, to, to beg the Colossians to lay hold of that faith and not let it go. He was saying, stick with the faith. Be grounded, be steadfast. And don't let any of that hope you've had in the good news get away from you. Don't let it go and that gift of salvation that's been freely given to you. Do not be moved away. And this message, this gospel of hope, Paul continues in verse 23 of chapter 1. And this is the second half of verse 23 that I, I left off at. He said that this gospel was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. What's Paul saying? I'm a minister of this glorious gospel of grace and I was called by Jesus Christ. I was called by God himself to preach this. Now this word translated as minister... It's probably from an obsolete Greek word, a word that we don't have anymore, which meant attendant, an attendant, a waiter, or a servant. Um, it can even mean a waiter at a table or in other menial duties. Specifically, it can be a Christian teacher or pastor, maybe a deacon or deaconess. Ooh, glory. Ooh, glory. Ooh. Ooh. Deacon, minister, or servant. Okay, that's what this word means. A true minister is one who executes the commands of another or who executes the commands of his master. And so here it's simple. Paul was executing the commands of another and this another was the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, Paul's master. And after Paul's life-changing moment with the Lord on the Damascus road, we all know the story in Acts chapter nine. Paul is now on a mission from God. He was Saul, as we know, a servant of his religious zeal and passions, and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But now, by the grace and mercy and election of God, he is now a servant, an attendant, an ambassador, and an agent of Jesus Christ. And he was called to bring the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, to the nations. What a transformation here in the life of Saul, and what a calling now to have. He went from Christian killer to Christ follower. It's amazing, isn't it, when you read that story? And we know that God would continue to use this man mightily in his service. And that's our theme for the next few verses in Colossians chapter 1. Tonight, suffering in service of Savior and saints. And you know what? Paul did exactly that. And Paul's going to be our example for that. Even here... In AD 64, all that time ago, we find Paul under house arrest in Rome. He's imprisoned. He's been imprisoned for his faith, for his zeal for Jesus, and his continual outright refusal to stop preaching and teaching concerning Jesus and the truth of the gospel, the good news for all nations. We know that many tried to shut him up, to put him out, to keep him from preaching the good news, but he kept going back. And now, Paul, we find Paul at the mercy of Rome and his life was in the hands of Rome. And it was here alongside his closest ally, Timothy, that he pens these wonderful words of truth, grace and love to his friends, to his brothers and sisters in Christ, whom, remember, he has never met. He's never met the Colossians. And he writes these wonderful words to them. And Paul, even though he's imprisoned, he writes with so much compassion and care for these saints. 
You see, Paul is a true shepherd. He is a true minister of the gospel. He exemplifies what it is to be a true minister of the gospel. He's a true and faithful attendant, and he's living out the commands of Jesus, his master. We know Paul called by God in God's plan and purpose, and Paul now being obedient to all that God had called him to do. What an example for all of us, church, to read through Paul's missionary journeys and his exploits and all the things that he got up to and all the journeys that God took him on, but he was faithful no matter what he came to face. Look, I want to ask you tonight, very simply, and I'm asking myself, are you being faithful in your calling? It's a simple question, but sometimes difficult to answer. Are you being faithful in your calling? Are you tonight, can you sit where you are tonight and say, yes, I am being obedient to what God has called me to do and what God has asked of me? Look, it doesn't matter how important you think your task is, or how maybe, how maybe how insignificant you feel with what you have to offer. God has called you and he wants you to serve him. I th- always think of the wee boy um, when Jesus feeds the five or 15,000. He brings that simple lunch. God can take what you have and he can multiply it and he can use it. It's wonderful. Serve him with the measure. I talked about the talents a few weeks ago. Serve him with that measure that God has given you. Serve with humility and with a sacrificial spirit. And I promise God will use you to accomplish things for him, great things for him. Now let's get back to the verse for tonight or I'll be here, <laughs> we'll be here all night. Colossians 1, 24 to 26. And I just want to read this for you. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. And I just want to do what we normally do, just work our way through the verse and try and find the gold contained within them. You know, I believe that the word of God always has something to say to us. Even if somebody just reads a psalm, somebody always gets something from it. And um, it always has something to teach us, even if we don't think it does at the first reading or hearing. Paul's first statement here, look, I'll be honest, when we read things like this, when I read things like this, it comes as a bit of a shock. Because it makes no sense to me, and I don't think that I'm going to be alone in this. What does Paul say? He says, listen, I now rejoice in my sufferings. I now rejoice in my sufferings. I rejoice. A primary verb to be full of cheer. Imagine that. Cheerful, calmly happy, well off. To rejoice, to be glad, to rejoice exceedingly. Paul was saying, I am rejoicing exceedingly in my sufferings. Okay, Paul, let's get this straight. You're saying that you're cheerful, happy, and content to be suffering. Is that right? You're actively rejoicing in the suffering that's come upon you. Paul, you're saying that you're glad to be in prison. You're glad to be in the place you are. I was thinking, like, man, what's, what is wrong with this guy? His serious problems. Paul, what's wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? Are you seriously rejoicing in your suffering? Because to me, it makes no sense. Look, because I think that this goes against everything we are as humans. We're fickle. We're weak. Let's be honest, church. We like to live in comfort and in peace. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? We're all very quiet tonight. We do our best, look, let's be honest, we do our best to avoid any kind of suffering, any kind of pain at all costs. But not Paul. Who likes to suffer? Who enjoys being in a place where life is painful and difficult? Who honestly enjoys when you're in a place, a situation, a circumstance that you don't want to be? I know I don't. But here Paul did. He did. Why? Well, the next two words from Paul's pen are so vital to understanding Paul's mentality and his heart. Paul writes, I rejoice in my sufferings 
Say it with me. For you. For you. The believers, the saints, the called out of God there in Colossa. Paul was saying, I rejoice in my sufferings for all of you, for every single faithful believer and follower at that assembly in Colossa. Church, this is where we're going. Paul was a selfless and a humble servant. That's truth. He was willing to go through whatever he must for the sake and the benefit of his fellow believers. He is rejoicing here in his trial and tribulation, in his suffering, in his imprisonment for the sake of the body of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul was never in this for himself. Paul never got into this for himself. He didn't do what he did for his own gain or for his own reward. He did it for the Savior he loved and the church that he cared for. That's why he went through it. Here is an example of a true servant in the service of God and in the service of others. Paul was living out what he had commanded the believers in Philippi to do. You remember the verses, to have the mind of Christ, to be of no reputation, to be a bond servant, to serve with humility and in complete obedience. Paul was taking Jesus Christ as his example with humility, with compassion, with care, with love, no pride, no self-serving, no self-seeking, just a deep, true, real love for God and for those who God had called him to care for. Paul was always serving the Savior and the saints in everything he did, in every word he spoke, in everything he wrote, and in everything he said. He was selfless, He was sacrificial. He even served while he was suffering. He didn't give up, didn't throw in the towel, can't do this anymore, I've had enough. He kept going. Church, what an example to all of us tonight. Paul had such a big heart for the Lord first and secondly for the church, for the head and for the body and for all the churches throughout the nations that God had called him to. And you know what? It showed, it shows in his writing and it showed in his actions. That's why Paul could write these words. He wasn't lying. He was in chains for the sake of his beloved brethren. And he was rejoicing in it. He was calm, he was happy, and he was content. What a man Paul was and what a faithful servant he was to the master. A great example, as I've said, to all of us in the service of Jesus our King. We know the passage, James a leader in the early church and a companion in the gospel with Paul wrote these words. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, that's mature and complete, lacking nothing. And Paul, even in chains, even under house arrest, was counting it all joy that he was facing this trial. His faith in the Lord was producing patience and that process was making him more mature and complete in his faith. Even while stuck in prison, Paul continued to serve the Savior and the saints with joy and calm contentment. Church, what faith in the Lord that Paul had. I would love to have faith like that. I honestly would. I'm envious of Paul's faith. Maybe some of us could do with a bit of that, couldn't we? Maybe some of us need that process, that test to refine us and make our faith in Jesus just that little bit stronger. You see, a trial, we know it's a test of faith which produces patience. And when that process of patience is done, we are more mature and complete in Christ. That's why we go through it. Look, let God have his way in your life and let the test of faith bring you closer to him. Paul continues in verse 24 with these words. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Church, I'm going to be honest with you. When I, when I began to study for this, I had to read those words a number of times because I, I was quite confused and taken aback by what Paul had said. Listen to what he says again. I fill up in my flesh... What is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of the body? Now, hold on, hold on a minute, Paul. Are you saying that there was something lacking in what Jesus Christ did? 
Did he not do enough? What exactly here was lacking in what Jesus Christ did? I thought, Paul, you're wrong here. You're wrong. There was nothing lacking in the afflictions of Jesus Christ. You've made a mistake. To be totally honest, I was a little caught off guard by these words until I understood the context of what Paul was actually saying here. Paul was not saying that Jesus, that what Jesus had done on the cross through his death, the atonement, his sacrifice, that somehow it was, a lacking, it was lacking in affliction and merit. No, that's not what Paul was saying. And I was so glad to read that or me and Paul wouldn't be friends anymore. You see, Paul is writing here in the context of service. And as we mentioned earlier, Paul is under house arrest in Rome. And Paul sees his sufferings as something that was working out for the good, the benefit, and the sake of others. For the body of Christ, this was always his focus. For his beloved at Colossa and for others. Church, understand that this word that Paul uses here, translated as afflictions, is never used in the New Testament to speak of what Jesus did on the cross. It's the word thlipsis, okay? And look at the meanings there. It's to be afflicted, to be in anguish, to be burdened, to be in persecution and tribulation and trouble. It's oppressing, oppressing together, oppression, oppression or distress, to suffer trouble. Church, Paul here is making reference to the affliction that Jesus suffered in his earthly ministry as he walked and talked with his disciples, as he taught and as he healed the people. And Paul is simply stating that those afflictions are not yet, they're not yet complete. And in this sense that Paul is using, Jesus still suffers as he ministers through Paul, through the other apostles and us, his elect people. Be sure you understand this, as I do now, thankfully. Paul was attaching no atoning or saving value whatsoever to his own sufferings as he served Christ in the church. The afflictions of Christ that Paul writes of here are never related to the redemptive sufferings of Christ, but, but they are speaking of ministerial or servant sufferings that Paul and others had and would bear for the sake of the body of Christ, for the church, for the called out ones, for the assembly of God. Look, church, these words came to my mind as I, as I studied for this. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And church, what about these words that we all know from the lips of Jesus? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, Jesus knew what his followers would face. He knew what they would face. But Paul went ahead with the mission. Paul was God-focused and he was others-focused. He was God-centered and he was other-centered. Everything he did was for the benefit of the elect, for the body of Christ. I've said it wasn't for himself. He wasn't in this for himself. He was in it for his master, for the Lord Jesus, and for those that he had been given care and charge over, the believers in Colossa and all the believers in the known world. Paul had been called to preach to the nations, and that's exactly what he did. He didn't grumble or complain when things came against him, and they did. He just dusted himself off and on he went. Listen to what he went through. We know this so well. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. 
in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? He goes through all of that and look what, his la- look what he writes. My deep concern for all the churches. Now do you see what his focus was? Did you just hear what Paul went through as he served and suffered for the Savior and for the saints? My deep concern for all the churches. Church, if you don't know what Paul's heart was, there it is right there. It was on display for all to see. Paul went forward with the mission while suffering for the sake of the church to fill up the afflictions of Christ for the very church that he loved. Church, what an example to all of us. And as he writes to the Colossian believers, he was in prison and he was rejoicing. He was calm, content, and he was happy because he was able to to still fulfill his calling by serving the church and being obedient to what the Lord had called him to do. To be a minister of the gospel, and that's what he was. To be a faithful servant, and he was that. To be a selfless servant, and he was that. To be a servant of the Savior whom he loved. Like I don't have time tonight to, to, to go on into verses 25 and 26. And they're so wonderful. Church, I want to leave you with a question tonight. Are we, like Paul, are we prepared to suffer in the service of our Savior and of the saints? Are we? Are we really prepared to go through whatever comes still faithfully serving the Lord? Listen to these words from Paul as he wrote to his young friend Timothy. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of all the Lord delivered me. Out of them all the Lord delivered me, yes, And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Church, did you read that? Did you hear it? All who desire to live godly, a life for Jesus Christ, will suffer persecution. But look at what else Paul said. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me. The Lord came to Paul's rescue time and time again, and he can do the same for you. And what about the words of comfort that Paul wrote to the divided church there in Corinth? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in... There, he's at it again. I take pleasure in infirmities. What's wrong with this guy? (laughs) Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And James 1 again, this is from the voice translation. Don't run from tests and hardships, brothers and sisters. As difficult as they are, you will ultimately find joy in them. If you embrace them, your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And that true patience brought on by endurance will equip you to complete the long journey and finish and cross the finish line, mature, complete, and wanting nothing. Church, Paul suffered with all joy in his service of the Savior and of the saints, will we? That's what I want to ask you tonight. He knew that he was called and he did not give up the fight or the faith. Will we take Paul as our example tonight? Will we live for the benefit and the sake of our Savior and our our fellow saints? We We are all called to suffer in the service of the Savior and the saints. I just want to know how will we respond? How will we react? I pray that we can be like Paul and rejoice in our sufferings for the King and for his beautiful bride. Amen, church. I love you all. Let's stand together. Thank you for your attention tonight.